Okay. So welcome again to our Meet the Experts program. My name is Tiffany Foreman, and I'm a science educator at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. And I'm here today with my colleague Nihant Cherokuru, who is a project scientist with NCAR. And obviously we're coming to you from our own homes, but we're still doing our work and we wanna share it with you. So every other Thursday, we meet with somebody who works at NCAR and we learn about what they do in their jobs and we answer questions from those of you who are participating. One really cool part about working in a place like NCAR and why we love to do this program is because there are so many different types of jobs, such as being a scientist or an engineer or an electrician or a computer programmer or a safety expert or a machinist. We have people that do all of those jobs and more at NCAR and all those different jobs help support the scientific research that's happening here. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Nihant and he's gonna tell you a little bit more about what he does and then take your questions. Thank you, Tiffany. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> okay, can you see the slide? Awesome. So yeah, welcome everybody. And I'm glad you all could join us today. And I'll be talking about data visualizations and provide you with a bird's eye view of the kind of work that we do uh, in the group at NCAR. So a little bit about myself, I'm Nihant and I'm a project scientist at NCAR. So I work in the visualization services and research group, which sits under the computational and information systems lab at NCAR. And one of the primary things that I do at NCAR is to explore novel ways to visualize data. And these novel ways and applications that we develop are geared both towards scientific staff and also general audience to inform them about the science and the work that is done at NCAR. And before we begin a little bit uh, of uh, some background about myself. So one thing that you see while, uh, when you hear from people, when, when you talk to them, uh, like if, if, when you talk to other employees at NCAR, you'll see that most of the work that's done here is interdisciplinary in nature. And that's the case even with me. So in fact, I didn't start with data visualizations initially. So in my grad school, I studied LIDARs and environmental fluid mechanics. So a LIDAR is this instrument that you see over here. So it shoots laser pulses into the atmosphere. And then by looking at the light that is scattered back from dust particles in the atmosphere, a LIDAR can actually paint a picture of the wind field around the instrument. So in olden days, like we could only take measurements that we call point measurements. So we could take sparse measurements from different places. But with technological advancements like LIDAR, we now have an opportunity to get a much denser and richer view of the atmosphere around you. And this was the stuff that got me interested in data visualizations to begin with. So talking about data visualization, what exactly is data visualization? So if you've seen, uh, or if you've attended some of the other Meet the Expert talks, then you would have seen this picture on the left. It's about uh, weather forecasting. So basically, if you are a scientist and like if, sci if a scientist wants to simulate the weather around the globe, they would start by constructing a grid around the globe. And in each grid point, uh, they would solve the uh, mathematical equations. And the results of those equations are what will inform the weather forecast. And that's the basis of any weather forecast modeling. So once that is done, any output of the weather forecast model is essentially a bunch of numbers. So if you look at the image on in the center, the output pretty much looks like this. So you would have a grid corresponding to the grid that is laid on the globe. And at each grid point, you would see some number corresponding to the quantity that's being measured. So in this example, it's surface temperature. And it's at this point that data visualization comes into play. So numbers by themselves are pretty hard to understand like what's happening. So the numbers by itself make it really hard for people to you know, go through each cell and see what's happening. So data visualization allows you to see patterns in this data by visually representing these numbers. 
And the way we do that is we start with uh, what we call as a color bar or think of it like a map legend. And you map all the values that occur in your, uh, in your simulation to this legend. And so every time you see a number, you color it with the color corresponding to that particular range. So in a way, if you look at a data visualization is similar to color, a coloring activity, it's like an adult's coloring book. But the only thing is that if you look at this uh, visualization on the right, so this is a practical visualization that we use and it's created by Matt Ramey, who also works at Visor. You can see that instead of simple grids, we have like millions of points. So obviously we can't sit and color them manually. And that's where we use computers. So we have computers and we write programs that sort of take this data and do that coloring activity for it. So if you zoom into one of this visualization, you can see a grid pattern similar to the coloring book on the top. So that's in two dimensions. And when you go to three dimensions, it's not very different. So instead of a single map or a single image, you would stack these coloring sheets one on top of another. And instead of simple grids that you see over here, you would have cubes. So a good analogy would be Minecraft. So if you've played Minecraft, you construct things using cubes all around. So with data visualizations, you could do the same thing, except that instead of randomly placing these cubes, you would have a computer uh, program that takes in this data and colors that cube and places them accordingly. So one example of a 3D visualization is the, this uh, visual of a hurricane. So, so moving on, if you see that data visualization borrows techniques and tools from different disciplines, and this is what I mean when I say data visualization is interdisciplinary. For instance, we have science involved because you need to know what is being visualized and what is interesting for people to see. Secondly, we need technology. So we deal with large amounts of data, so we can't do it manually and we write computer programs and we also create applications that help see these uh, that help make the data visualization process uh, easy and interesting. And secondly, art also plays an important role because at the end of the day, who wants to see a boring visualization? So art does play a role in like making it riveting and keeping people engaged. So today we'll go through, I'll touch upon and give you examples from each of these fields and it will be interactive. So as we move forward, like uh, you can enter some of the questions in the chat window below. So to start with art, one aspect in data visualization is choosing the right colors. And this is the first activity. So, and obviously you would have recognized the picture of Mona Lisa. So the question is, what is strange in the picture on the left? So you can feel free to enter your answer in the chat. I'm seeing a couple comments already. It's so red. Lots of reds, what people are commenting yep. so far. That's a good observation. You see a certain color represented a lot more than others. Oh, and the image is not as clear, somebody said, and it's red where it would be lighter in the other one. Okay, that's a good observation. Just a few more seconds and we'll discuss. If not as pleasant to look at. That is very important. Aesthetics play a big role in creating a good data visualization. So one thing that uh, is different between these two images is that uh, so, so these pictures are created by recoloring the Mona Lisa painting and you recolor using the color bar at the bottom. Remember the legend that I mentioned a couple of slides ago. And if you look at the colors for the picture on the left, you can see that the colors sort of fade and blend into one another. Whereas the color bar on the left, these colors, they don't necessarily blend in. So they jump across all, they jump all over the place. And in fact, this is a this is the notorious rainbow color map, which is which you find very, which is very common, and I've used it in the past too. So the issue with rainbow color maps is that like when you have colors that jump from 
one color to another, you can start seeing patterns that don't exist. So for in, in this case, you've already seen the Mona Lisa painting. So you know what the ground to truth looks like. So you can tell that by using a rainbow color map, you get a picture that is not quite right. However, when you're working with data, you don't know beforehand how a data looks like. So that's why it's important. It becomes important to choose the right color map because if you don't do that, you can end up seeing patterns that don't exist. For instance, this is one example that's often cited in papers. So if you look at this image, the first thing that jumps off, at least for me, is that demarcation that goes right through the center of the United States from Texas all the way to the north. By looking at this picture, it feels as if there's a clear line that separates the eastern United States and western United States. However, if you look at the numbers, the numbers flow uniformly. The demarcation that you see is an artifact that comes from the colors that we choose. So it's important. So th this is the importance of choosing. Like you, you have the artistic liberty to choose any color that you want. However, you have to make sure that the colors are consistent and they flow from one thing to another. And another important consideration is that uh, for people who are colorblind, if you use some combinations of reds and greens, then the visualization pretty much becomes useless for them because reds and greens would appear the same way. So, and that's the importance of choosing the right colors. Now, moving on to science. So one thing uh, that is important is something called map projections. So map projection is a way in which you take a sphere, so Earth is a sphere, and you take anything that's on the surface of a sphere and you lay it flat on a flat surface. And it turns out there's more than one way to represent a globe on a flat sheet of paper. And these are some of the visualizations that uh, were created by Matt and Tim from, again, Weiser. And it turns out there are a lot of these map projections. And this is another design choice that you have when you're showcasing uh, data that spans the globe. And the reason for having so many of them is that there is no such thing as a perfect map. So when you take a sphere and flatten it, you invariably stretch out certain areas. And the stretching process distorts certain regions on a map. So based on what you're trying to visualize through your data visualization, certain map projections work better than the other. In fact, who knows, like maybe in the future, you might have to create your own map projection that represents a certain quantity that you are interested in seeing. So it, it's an open problem and also something interesting. And when I speak about distortions, here's a quick activity for you guys to uh, try out. So, so I'm from India and let us say I want to move from Boulder, Colorado. I want to travel and visit my parents who live in India. And I obviously want to take the shortest path from Boulder to India. So assuming I want to take the shortest path, which one would I choose? Would I take path A, path B, or would I take path C? So you can enter your answer in the chat below. I will reset the timer. And if you need a hint, the, the animation in the lower right corner shows you how this map was obtained from a spherical Earth. We have some guesses for C so far. Great. Anybody else want to take a guess? There's another vote for C. Come on, does anybody want to guess A? Come on. <laughs> A is feeling lonely. <clears throat> <A's> <laughs> uh, someone said, looks like A from this view. That looks like the simple answer, right? Great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out C is the right answer. <clears throat> and you can see that through this application. So this is another application that we developed that helps uh, people try out different map projections. And the reason why C is the shortest path is that like this map, you need to put it back on a sphere. And when you put it back on a sphere, C turns out to be the shortest path on that curved surface. And the projection that we've used, it's called uh, the equirectangular projection. 
or cylindrical equidistant projection. And this type of projection is good for visualizing data near the equator. However, if you, let us say you are a scientist who is studying sea ice and you wanna see sea ice that mostly exits at the pole, then this visualization is probably not an ideal thing to see because it distorts the land near the poles. And if you want to visualize polar data, then you might probably choose one of these projections, which basically looks at the earth from the North and South pole. So with this projection, there's a lot of distortion near the uh, equator and none at the poles. So all this to say, you get to choose, a, you need to choose the right visualization that goes with the science that you are studying. And this also transitions us into the next aspect of visualizations that is technology. For instance, this application that I've shown uses something called augmented reality. So augmented reality is a technology that allows you to see digital objects and place them in real world. Now, before we go dive deeper into it, here's another activity. So this is an example visualization that I've created during my, in my grad school. In the center is Pokemon Go, and that's an example of an augmented reality app, which is very popular. And I think you must have seen it one way or the other. And the video on the right shows one application that helps visualize some of the data. So the question is, what are the similarities that you see between the Pokemon Go screenshot and the data visualization application on the right? And bonus points if you can find the Easter egg. You can enter your answer in the chat below. We have one suggestion of 3D. Yes. Data visualization is getting is increasingly three-dimensional in nature. Um, here's, I guess, is the Easter egg a Pokeball in the one on the right? I did not observe it. So maybe there are two <laughs> Easter eggs. <laughs> Uh, and someone else says they are both on a real background. That is an excellent observation. A few more seconds and we'll move on. Yep. So, so as someone has pointed out, it is true. So both of them use something called augmented reality. And, and if, if you look at the Pokemon Go, you have this animated character that is placed in the real world. And this is primarily used for entertainment, but we could use the same technology that is used to create games like Pokemon Go to visualize data. In fact, the, the visualization that you see over here with the wind field flowing around the crater is not very different than the animated character that you see in the center. And like using techniques like augmented reality, you can bring the data that was initially collected from the real world and you can visualize it in the real world. So traditional visualization revolved uh, us having to visualize this stuff on a two-dimensional computer screen. However, using techniques like AR, we can then bring this data and overlay it on at the location where the data is collected. So it makes the interpretation process more intuitive and engaging. And now for the Easter egg, if you see after giving all the spiel about, you know, using the right color maps and not having to use rainbow maps, I've used rainbow color maps too in the past. And the reason for that is, you know, at that time I didn't know and you learn over time. So like, yeah, always one thing that really helped me is that uh, there's always more to learn and you learn and grow like as you move forward. So yeah, don't use rainbow color maps. So that's a bad example. <laughs> so moving in, moving on. So we, we have 
created some of the uh, like some other augmented reality applications too so one advantage of augmented reality is that uh, as i've said you can see digital objects in your real world and you can also scale those digital objects to their real size for instance if you look at the pictures with the pets on the left the white thing that you see is a it's a representation of a hailstone from that fell in vivian south dakota a couple of years ago and that's the largest hailstone that uh, was ever recorded in the united states so you can now you have an opportunity to place the hailstone in your surroundings and see and compare it with some of the commonly found objects around you so to and this is a web based application so the qr codes take you to that respective application so if you you just need a smartphone it works on both android and ios and we have some of the other models too you can place a supercomputer in your house to see like how big that is or place a hurricane in it and the application to the right is another example of where uh, we use augmented reality to engage general audience and inform them about the visualizations that we've produced in our group so meteo ar is uh, i think the simplest way to describe it is an interactive science sheets so the science sheets have information about different data sets that we worked on in the past and the qr code which is over here slightly hidden by the virtual object it informs the application to overlay a certain data set corresponding to the plane to the page over there and by turning the page you can they change the data set and it gives you an interactive and fun way to explore different data sets so going into the future so so what's next so yeah we do continue uh, we continue this work uh, even now like we are on the lookout for novel applications and how we can make visualizations better and one of the underexplored area right now that we are interested in getting into is accessibility so one theme that is common in in most of the stuff that i've described earlier is that it's all visual in nature and that has a that poses a challenge for people who are blind or vision impaired so by bringing in the technology and techniques that have been used to make certain things accessible to people who are blind and vision impaired we'll be able to make visualizations access um, accessible to people who uh, he couldn't access these visualizations in the past and we are at a right intersection to do something like this because technologies like uh, augmented reality as i've said they help you bring the digital objects into your real world so what this means is that in the past when you had to work through a two dimensional screen to visualize data you can now visualize it in your 3d space and that makes it intuitive for people who are sighted and also it gives people who are blind an opportunity to find novel ways to walk through and explore data sets so the image on the top shows like how your phone running an augmented reality application makes sense of the world around you and this is my apartment and the yellow dots are basically what my phone thought were interesting features in the world so it could be a texture or it could be something on the carpet or uh, like over here you can see it's, it's the couch so it's it's taken patterns from the couch so by using this information a phone is now aware of like where it is in the surroundings and then you can start placing relevant information and you can start placing visuals in that uh three dimensional space that could help inform uh people who are blind and vision impaired on how to e explore that space so moving so going into the future like one thing that i would summarize is that uh, like most of the work that i do is interdisciplinary in nature so if you are interested in a certain field be thinking about how that can apply to some other problem so there are many problems but you'll be surprised at how you come across solutions like maybe the solution to your problem is not in your field but you might get it from some other field so yeah with that i will take further questions and i thank everyone for being patient and attending the stock great thank you nihant it's sure. pretty awesome
the work that you do. And I'd love to take any questions to share with Nihant. If anybody has any questions about what you've heard or you wonder something else about the work he does. I have a question, Nihant, while other people are entering theirs. Mm -hmm. With the choosing your colors, are okay. there are there kind of known color palettes that work better for certain applications or is it kind of just using your eye and and figure out how to best um, <clears throat> replicate yeah. you know what you're trying to do mm -hmm. so now you do have a lot of uh, as i've said like artistic liberty to use the kind of colors that you want to use however people often tend to use the colors that closely represent the quantity that's being visualized. For instance, uh, if it's a visualization about sea ice, maybe a palette involving whites and blues would look more appealing and it's more convenient. And at the same time, if you're visualizing temperature, it's common to use uh, any color palette that involves reds and blues preferably blues for colder temperatures and red for warmer temperatures because that's what we are used to expecting like uh, uh, yeah we like, red things are hot and cool things uh, are blue so you, so you can base something off of like some of the previous understanding that we have about the phenomenon that's being visualized but again having said that you can use some other data sets some other colors too just making sure that they flow smoothly one into the other. Interesting. I've got a couple of questions coming in and also just an appreciation for how cool it is that you're working to make all of this accessible to visually impaired and blind communities. So that's a yeah, great that's application a for this. Work. Yeah, that could be done in that field. And honestly, we are just now getting into it. So we're still at the beginning stages, I would say. That's great. Somebody else wonders, how did you know you wanted to go into this field of work? Well, the answer is, I didn't know from the beginning. It was like my work informed me like where I could go next. So like uh, one thing that I see is that uh, I was in general interested in learning about new things. So uh, as and when I found different interesting things from some of the other fields, I tried to apply them to my field and I let my work sort of dictate where it takes me next. So like I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be accurate to say that I knew right from the beginning what I wanted to do. Hmm. Great. Here's another good question. It seems like a lot of scientific visualizations require complex coding. Are there any programs or tips that you'd suggest for newbies? So the good news, so two things. Yes, it is true that data visualizations can be complex, but at the same time, the good news is there are many tools that are available online. So depending on how much experience you have with computers and stuff, like these days almost everyone can use computers. So you might be able to do data visualizations without knowing to do any coding because there are applications uh, that in fact, like there are some applications that we've developed at NCAR, some of the other groups too. So we have something called uh, NCAR command line, like language, so NCL and Vapor. So these two are softwares that we've developed. And if you are using these softwares to visualize data, you would have a graphical user interface that you can use to load the data and you know change the colors and play with it and do the visualization without getting into the coding aspect of things. Hmm. So, so yeah, look for data, uh, data visualization tools and applications that are already out there. Great, thank you. Sure. And somebody else asked if you can say a little bit more about the accessibility piece of this. Is there anything in use now around that? Yes. So, so basically, <clears throat> excuse me. So we are using the same technology that allows you to place these digital objects in like 2D, like in your 3D world, just like a visual hail model. We are exploring uh, augmenting the real world with audio cues. 
So in fact, we are working with a, a major museum in trying to make the indoor spaces accessible and to help people who are blind and vision impaired navigate those spaces. So for instance, if you look at the image in the lower uh, right corner, so you have a bunch of posters on the wall and by using the, an application, so the user over here, she's holding a phone that's running an augmented reality application. And when the phone intersects a certain area or when it comes in close proximity to a certain map, or, or sorry, a certain poster, it can read out what's there on the poster. So in a way, it the idea is to give people who are blind an opportunity to explore the surroundings like how uh, people with vision do in the sense that you can see what's around you and you can decide like whether you want to go deeper into that particular topic or move on to another topic. So th this is our work in progress. So we have one prototype and we are working with another museum to scale it up and to create an application that can be widely used by other organizations too. That is just fascinating. It seems like there's so much that can be done with that and will be as time goes on. Yeah. I don't see any other questions. We'll make a last call for questions and um, there's a lot of appreciation in the chat. A lot of awesome presentation comments. <laughs> All right then. So I would just like to say thank you, Nihant, for joining us and for um, telling us about your work a little bit more. There is one more question. If we're a little bit over time, but if you've got enough time. Absolutely. This is, this is a really good question. What classes yes. did you enjoy as a kid? I actually enjoyed uh, my art classes. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, there's that piece. Yeah, and uh, I know there was there's this tool online called uh, Google SketchUp, and it, it allows you to construct these virtual worlds online. It, it's a, I think it's a web-based tool. At least it was a web-based tool like many years ago. And things like modeling, uh, like 3D modeling, in which uh, like you're given a bunch of options and you can construct things together those activities and my favorite class was like obviously science and that's what led me to choose a science-based major going into the future but it was mostly science and art mm -hmm. and I had to connect the dots like after I moved forward. There are a lot of connections though that's what's so fascinating science and art really are connected in so many ways that we don't often think about really. Absolutely. Yes. That was a great question. So again, I would just like to say thanks for joining us. Um, it's been really fun to hear about what you do and thanks for sharing that. And thanks to everybody who has participated and joined us today. Um, for future reference, we do meet the expert sessions every other Thursday. So hopefully some of you will join us again in the future. The next session is on November 12th and that's going to be talking to an aircraft mechanic who works for NCAR's research aviation facility. And he's gonna tell us about how the airplanes are used and how important his work is in keeping them ready to fly and ready to go on research missions. So we'll post the link in the chat to our, I'll do that right now, to our Meet the Experts page where you can follow our schedule and you can find recordings of all of our past Meet the Experts sessions. That's the link to that. And then I'm also going to share the link. Nihanth gave us a link to their visualization gallery of Nihanth's work group. I'm going to put that there if you'd like to check out more with the augmented reality and the things that they're doing. And with that, I think we'll close for the day. If there is anybody still here uh, who's in grades 5 through 12, um, if you wouldn't mind filling out that quick survey, we would really appreciate it. And I'm going to, it looks like Tim's going to paste the link to that survey. It is outside of this presentation. Um, if you don't mind going to that page for the survey, we would really appreciate it. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks Bye -bye. Tiffany and Tim. Take care. Bye.